showdown for the top spot at the 3A level, and it goes down to the wire. Plus, a homecoming for an evergreen volleyball coach. See why she has her players' undivided attention. And River coach Brianne Smedley explains her team's hot start. Plus, see why Skyview's golf team says bigger is better. And hear from Micah Wrights of the Columbian. It's time for your Clark County Scoreboard. Hello and welcome to Clark County Scoreboard, I'm Brian Slyke. We start our show with the biggest matchup on the football field last week. Let's head out to Kelso where the Highlanders faced off against Mountain View for a 3A battle, one that could determine who wins the league. The Kelso crowd was hyped for this one. On its first possession, Kelso marched 67 yards to the Mountain View 13 yard line before Jacob Martin ending their chance with the pick on this pass. Then, Mountain View took it all the way back with an 80-yard drive thanks in part to a 35-yard reception by J.J. Thompson who slips a couple defenders on the way. It looks like he gets the pylon here, but the refs say no. And next play, Micah Johnson caps it off with a one-yard run, 7-0 Mountain View. Kelso comes right back. On fourth down, Hunter Wattier finds Zeke Smith near the sideline from five yards out for the touchdown, and we're all tied up at seven. Mountain View, though, responds right away with this strike to Aiden Nicholson for the 44-yard touchdown reception, and they go up 13-7. Another Kelso drive, another Mountain View stop, ending the Highlanders drive at the 6, setting up this Mason Smith field goal, 13-10 Mountain View. With time winding down in the first half, Mountain View goes 72 yards down the field. This big run by Mitch Johnson taking on three Highlanders sets up the touchdown. As Johnson dives across the line at the horn, and they take the lead 20 to 10 into halftime. The second half was all about defense. Mountain View would not score again, and Colby Cooper from Kelso gets the game within three points, 20 to 17 Mountain View. Time winding down on the game when Mountain View is flagged for pass interference at the goal line. After a penalty on Kelso at the line, they decide to go for the field goal to tie the game, but Mason Smith boots it wide left. You hate to see it, and Mountain View holds on to win 20 to 17. Yeah, we knew that they had a pretty good defense, but you know, we just stuck together and our quarterback, we got a lot of trust in him. Uh, one of my best friends, you know, I love him. That's my brother. And he just kept us together, kept us as one, and we pushed through. For Mountain View coach Adam Matheson, the victory is number 100 in his career, a huge milestone, thanks to one of the best Mountain View teams in recent memory. It's huge, you know, uh, Matt's a great coach, you know, one of the most important people in my life, made a huge impact, and being able to experience that with him, Oh, that's an amazing feeling. Mountain View now stands in first place in the 3A Greater St. Helens League. Out to Kiggins Bowl, where it's homecoming for the Hudson's Bay Eagles as they host the Monarchs of Mark Morris. Hudson's Bay's defense was great all night long, and they get the scoring started. In the first minute of the game, the Monarchs fumble the ball away, and Justice Phelan says, I'll take that for the scoop and score. After the extra point, it's 7-0, and the Eagles are flying high early. Later in the first, a little trickery from Mark Morris. Quarterback Kellen Desbians fakes the handoff, rolls to his left, and has an open receiver and the free real estate ahead of him. He decides to keep it and strolls in for the score. The Monarchs don't convert the extra point, and it's 7-6 Hudson's Bay. Second quarter, Hudson's Bay driving. Dylan Damos takes the receiver's screen and lowers his shoulder deep into the red zone. Next, it's Mateo Verona's turn, and he wore his PF Flyers gliding virtually untouched. And at halftime, we have a new homecoming queen for Hudson's Bay. Ella Gilly takes home the tiara in a sharp-looking tux, and things are looking up for the Eagles. But the second half, Mark Morris makes a big change, moving to the wing tee offense and moving the ball downfield. Here's a one-yard run from Jaden Anderson, and with a two-point conversion, we're all tied up at 14. Later, in the fourth quarter, Mark Morris takes the lead on this run from Cade Warren. With just a minute and a half left, it's Warren again, this time coming out of the backfield for the Desbians throwback pass and scooting all the way into the end zone. 27-14 Mark Morris, but Hudson's Bay isn't done. With just five seconds left on the clock, Dean Castillo drops this ball into Caden Gonzalez's hands, and it's 27-21. 
They needed a miracle on this onside kick, and they don't get it. Mark Morris holds on to win 27-21. They've now won three in a row, while the Eagles are searching for their first win. Out now to Doc Harris Stadium in Camas, where the papermakers take on Battleground. The opening kickoff was a sign of things to come for Camas as a hole big enough for a semi to drive through. The papermakers return it all the way to the 30-yard line. The camera operator can't keep up and neither can the Tigers. That sets up a run from John Schultz. He had two touchdowns on the night. Later, the air attack gets going as the papermakers score on the slant and Camas walks away with their first win of the year. 56-6 over Battleground and they're 1-0 in the league. Let's head up to Longview where R.A. Long is hosting Columbia River in a big 2A matchup. R.A. Long looks good early driving down the field before settling for this lane over low field goal to go up 3-0. End of the first quarter, Victor Flores gets the handoff and takes it up the middle for a Columbia River touchdown and they'd hold on to the lead from there. Second quarter, Adam Watts goes deep to Aiden Flores on the near side, and it's 14-3 Columbia River. Their defense was great all night, and they'd have one more visit to the end zone. Watts rolling out, goes deep again, this time to Thomas Blau, who is all alone, and that's the final score. After dropping their first three games of the year, it's two wins in a row for Columbia River as they beat R.A. Long 21-3. From the turf to the hardwood, volleyball is in the middle of league play, and it's getting good. We take you out to Columbia River High School, where the Rapids are red hot and taking on Woodland. The Rapids get off to a quick start. After digging a Woodland swing and surviving the overpass, the ladies finish this rally off with a kill of their own. And that's kind of how it would go for them all night. They cap off the lopsided first set win with this slide from Sydney Dreves. 25-5 was the final in set one. On to set number two, and it's more the same. After a great Woodland dig, Columbia River rises to the challenge at the net and stuffs this one, taking set number two by the same score, 25 to five. Ahead to the third set, Rapids up 24 to five, and they end it in familiar fashion with another big kill this time from Riley Reeves, whose look says all business. Warren Reeves ended the night with 10 kills to pace the Rapids. Next up, River versus Washugal, and it's another blowout. The Rapids get off to a great start, taking set one 25 to eight. Warren Dreves was on automatic all night long with a team high 11 kills for Columbia River. The second set saw a rare shutout as the Rapids take it 25 to nothing. In the third set, coach empties the bench to get the youngsters some court time and they handle their business winning set three 25-21. The Rapids are now 8-1 with their sole loss coming to undefeated Ridgefield. Part of the reason Columbia River is having such a good year is the steady guidance of Coach Breanne Smedley, and she joins us now to talk about the team. Hey Coach, thanks for joining us and thanks for being here. Thanks for having me on, I'm doing really well. Your team has had great success this season, only losing three sets. What has led to the production from your team? We have amazing players and athletes. <laughs> we just have a really great, solid group. Um, we've got some some good depth in each position and each each player in each position comes with they came in with a wealth of knowledge and experience in their position and since then they've only continued to choose to work hard um, and they have big goals for themselves. Um, this is a new team for us really. We, uh, we graduated a lot last year and a lot that had been kind of a foundation of our team for the past four years. And um, so they had big shoes to fill in a way, and they have stepped into it and just have created their own mark on this program. And, and they just have, they have their eyes set on, on state and not just state, but being, um, earning a state title. So we're living up to that. Not trying to single out any one person, but who are some of the players that have stood out in Clark County should keep an eye on this season? So Riley Reeves is, is one that comes to mind right away. She's our, our outside who has been with us for the past four years on varsity. Um, she, you know, just this past season has really stepped into that role as a go-to. She is very level-headed, really consistent all the way around, sixth rotation outside. Um, she's really just honed in a lot of things. You know, I've, I've been uh, really lucky to be able to see her as a freshman and now as a senior. And uh, it's just really cool to, to, to kind of see her stepping into her own and really owning her position. Um, so yeah, she's a, a huge one, um, along with Caroline Hansen, who is our setter. 
she's really great. Uh, I mean, running the offense. Um, and then Lauren Dreves and Sydney Dreves. So we have um, Allie Dreves graduated last year. Uh, her two sisters are coming through. So Lauren is a sophomore and Sydney is a freshman. And they, you know, they they have great pedigree. Um, and you know, they they just have really stepped in. They they both played at a at a high level. Um, you know, prior to coming in and, and they, they just raise the level of intensity on our court. Okay, speaking about intensity, as somebody who's been around the league for a bit, could you talk about what makes volleyball in this area so tough? I think what makes it tough is that just in this like localized area of Clark County and even, you know, in North Clark County, um, all the way up to Olympia really is uh, these girls play club together and a lot of them you know we we look across the net at Ridgefield and you know they're like oh you know play club with them <laughs> and so they're all they're all they all just play together year round really and um so that's what makes it tough but in a good way it makes it really competitive makes it intense um the players know each other's tendencies because they see each other and so they get to kind of engage in like this chess match basically they're like hey I know this like she likes to hit here and um, this is how we can, you know, stop, stop her um, because they've seen each other. Like they're just familiar with each other. Um, and so I think that's it, what, one of the reasons why it makes it um, so tough and so competitive is they're just playing together year round at a high level. You brought up Ridgefield and so far the Spartans are the only team to get the best of the Rapids so far this season. What is that rivalry like with the second match only two weeks away? They're definitely one when we play Ridgefield and I think when Ridgefield plays us, uh, they play their best match and they're their best volleyball, which is great. Um, it's always competitive. It's always fun. It's always a little frustrating, I think, <laughs> but it's definitely a match that we always look forward to. And so this rivalry, you know, I think it, it dates back to when we, when River joined 2A, um, however many years ago that was, and Ridgefield, it's always been kind of back and forth. Um, they've gotten the better of it <laughs> for the past, the past couple, but a um, couple years, I think. But, you know, the um, Riley and Caroline, I think are the only ones, if I can remember correctly, but, uh, you know, they were on that team where they beat Ridgefield um, to win districts um, that, in the 2018 season. Um, and so, you know, they just always, we just have that, like, fire to, you know, to come back and, and take it to them. So they're... You know they're watching film. We're 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 doing everything to to be able to like notice what their tendencies are and and to like we know their team. They know us, and it's kind of one of those like on any given night, like who who's going to step up, um, you know. And for us, the last time we played them, it was back and forth up until you know a certain point, and then they would pull ahead. So for us, it's maintaining our composure and being patient and staying in it until the end because we know with a team like Ridgefield, it's it's never going to be just like a, a one, one rally and kill mm -hmm. and done. It's going to be who can outlast um, and, and who can stay in it for, for the entirety of the point and the set and the whole match. So, With about a month left in the season, what are some goals and things that your team is trying to work on before the end of league play? Yeah, we're about the halfway season right now, which is a really, it's one of my favorite parts of the season because we get to kind of see like where we've, where we've been and then we get to look forward to see where where we're going and um really it's just improvement every day i know that sounds very maybe cliche but um a lot of times when we focus on the outcome like yes we want to beat richfield yes we want to um go to districts qualify for state and you know and and really take a, a run at that title but we when we just focus on those things we lose sight of the day-to-day and so I try and have the girls like we're, yeah, that's like our North star. We know that that's out there and that's a, a standard and an expectation that we're, we're shooting towards, but we're never going to get there if we just like keep looking at that. So mm -hmm. we try and um, bring our focus down to like one step at a time. We're just going to like focus on the day to day. What do we need to improve on today? And sometimes it is a skill or a tactical thing with our team, but a lot of times it's like, you know, where do we need to connect more with each other? We need, where do we need to um be better in our communication so we're just like focusing on that one step at a time and then we can look up and see like oh here we are we're at state okay um but we know we won't get there if we're if we're just not focusing on that constant daily improvement so. thanks coach and good luck the rest of the season thank you <laughs> over at evergreen high school the volleyball coach is getting her players to buy in craig burnback joins us now from evergreen sports to explain how she's doing it craig 
Thanks, Brian. This week, we're going to throw the EPS Clark County scoreboard spotlight on some girls sports, and we'll start with volleyball. We're over at Evergreen High School. Their new head coach, Nichelle Bethune, is looking to build the Plainsman back into a postseason threat. And while she knows it won't be easy, Bethune knows it can be done because she did it back when she was a player at Evergreen. After a win over Heritage this week, Evergreen's head volleyball coach, Nichelle Bethune, was happy with the results. Tonight was the first time that everything that we asked him to do came into place. But Coach Bethune's not focused on just individual victories. She's looking to rebuild a program. We're still in that starting phase of building. I'm just trying to get Evergreen athletes, female athletes, to, to say, like, hey, we're just as good as the other schools as well. People just say, oh, it's just Evergreen, but I want them to actually be fearful of Evergreen. Fearful of us, but we will respect all. And Bethune knows of what she speaks. Back in 2002, she was a star player on a district champion team at, you guessed it, Evergreen High School. We were district champs my year, so we definitely were feared. We walked into the court and people knew that Plainsman meant business. And Bethune still means business, and her players, they know it. We always feel the energy, we feel the love. We know she has a deep passion for the school, and it's always been great talking to her about her time and everything that she's done at Evergreen. And being the head volleyball coach at Evergreen, well, it didn't just happen. Back when she was a student, Bethune knew she wanted this exact job. As a matter of fact, she put it in the yearbook. I did put, I wanted to be a head volleyball coach and a head gymnastics coach at Evergreen High School. Those were the two main sports that I did. It, it came true. It came true because Bethune put in the work. She's been coaching since 2006 and because she connects with her players. She's really nice and respectful and very caring, cares about all the players and about all of our outside lives before volleyball. And then when we step on the court, she makes sure that we're focused and ready to play. And the players don't just see their coach on the court, but Thune is a security guard at the school. They just know that I have expectations that they are students first and then athletes. So I make sure that they remember to be a student, get to school on time, be appropriate. And the players are listening to their coach because she knows exactly what it's like to be a player at Evergreen High School. I think it's every coach's dream when they get to a school, they're hoping that they can connect with the students. And I feel like that my connection automatically is because I was an actual Plainsman that played in the volleyball program. Bethune, who was actually hired in 2020, is now coaching her first full season. Now, she previously played for and coached under Lori Piland, who was also an Evergreen High School graduate. Let's head to Mountain View High School, where we had a sibling rivalry on Monday night as Thunder head coach Rochelle Howington was squaring off against her sister, Cheyenne Knight. But this one belonged to the Thunder, who have a star in Adida Lejuka. She's going to come across and finish this point off. Later, more Lajuka as she gets a great set from Bethany Pham. And then that's a Thunderbolt finish. Mountain View finishes off the victory three games to zip. OK, let's run back the Mountain View battleground matchup, but switch sports and talk some soccer. That's right, last Thursday night, Mountain View hosted at McKenzie Stadium. And one goal would decide it. Here's some great give and go action from the Thunder that's going to lead to a great pass from Audrey Vision, who has the great vision to see Ellie White, who does her job with the perfect finish, into the back of the net. Mountain View's varsity wins it 1 to 0. Honestly, we just stayed the course. Um, we didn't really change a whole lot. Um, that's the way soccer is sometimes. We you know, had, like you said, plenty of opportunities, and luckily we were able to put one in. Uh, I, I thought that uh, our back line played very well. Um, obviously, maintained the shutout. Um, you know, again, things we got to work on is finishing the opportunities we have um, was kind of the main things I addressed at the end. We also had some exciting action at the JV level. Check out the big boot from Turin Calvert. Great effort here from the battleground goalie to keep it out of the net, well, for a bit. Because here comes Elizabeth Messman, and Messman's going to clean up the mess in front of the net. Perfect strike. Mountain View's JV also victorious with a 2-0 final. Now this week, EPS Sports will be broadcasting some volleyball as we'll show both the JV and varsity games between Evergreen and Mountain View. They can be seen live on our YouTube channel. And of course, Brian, we'll be right back here next week with more fall sports fun on the Clark County scoreboard. But for now, I'm going to send it back to you at VPS.
Thanks, Craig. The Skyview High School boys golf team has its eyes on state this year. Win or lose, it may have already broken a state record for the biggest team ever. It's one of the reasons they're so good, but as Nick Vole reports, it's also a major challenge. Roll star! We caught up with the team on a drizzly afternoon at Pinecrest Golf Course. Coach Pat Ramberg knew coming into the year he'd have a big team, but not this big. I bought enough shirts for the coaches and 40 kids, but uh, we ran short, so... I uh, have a few that didn't get a shirt, but they're on the way. <laughs> a whopping 47 golfers turned out, and since it's a no-cut sport, they're all out on the course. We start a line at the first hole, and I mean, if it gets a little backed up, then we'll just spread them out on the other parts of the course. So. This is the most I've seen in any team, more than I've seen in a tournament a couple times. Problem number one, how do you find enough holes for this many kids? We might be the only school that has two courses, Tri-Mountain and Pinecrest. The Pinecrest course is walkable from school, gives the team a good rate, and provides opportunities. This program would, would not be like it is now without Pinecrest. They have the opportunity, all these young kids, to put a score down every day. You know, every time they play. They play three days a week. And uh, that, that really taps into them wanting to get better and be out here with their friends. Two assistant coaches are in charge at Pinecrest. The Pinecrest kids are the newer kids, mm -hmm. a lot of freshmen and, and new to golf. You hear a lot of fours happening. It makes life a little more interesting. Well, I mean, I'm not on varsity, but I mean, I'd love to play varsity, but um, it's definitely hard to play varsity. Coach Ramberg oversees the varsity squad at Tri-Mountain. That leads us to problem number two. With only 10 slots available, that leaves 37 kids trying to get on varsity. There's a lot of competition. There's a couple, there, I'm guessing there's like a handful of guys just competing for that one spot on varsity. Um, mad respect to them. With a deep roster, Skyview has big hopes for this season. I think we can win districts. Um, I'm very confident in my team, my top three, very confident in them. I like those dudes. Um, and three of us, I think they're guaranteed to make state. So uh, hopefully we can serve Skyview proud. State or not, the big turnout is a win for the Skyview program. I'm hoping it's a testament to our program. Kids are having fun. There's no real way to determine whether the 47-man roster is the biggest in state history, but most of the athletic folks that we talk to say they've never heard of a team this large. We'll keep our eyes on the storm as they head toward districts. It's been a wild week with lots of fun matchups ahead of us. Joining me now to talk about it is the sports editor for the Columbian, Micah Rice. Just when it seemed like Kelso would grab a hold of the top spot in the league, they got tripped up by Mountain View. What are your thoughts on football at the 3A level? Well, a huge win for Mountain View. It's always difficult to go up to Kelso and win up there. Uh, Kelso, over the years, as we know, always puts a quality team on the field. So for Mountain View to go up there and get a win, uh, it came down to the last play, and they were able to persevere with Kelso uh, missing a potential game-time field goal at the end. Huge win for the Thunder, and it puts them in the lead when it comes to uh, the teams everyone's chasing in the Greater St. Helens League at the 3A level. So uh, uh, side plot on that, big win for Mountain View coach Adam Matheson, his 100th for the Thunder. And so, uh, or not just for the Thunder, his 100th career win. For, uh, so um, uh, congratulations to Coach Matheson uh, and the Thunder on a huge win. And uh, uh, they're the team to beat now in the 3A. Cam has picked up their first win and 4A league play should get interesting now with Skyview and Union both unblemished in league play. And we always knew that it was going to come down to those three teams, Union, Skyview, and Camus. And whenever those two teams or two of those three teams clash against each other, the results of those games are going to be what uh, determines who's on top in the 4A GSHL. So we, we knew Camus, you know, I've said it before, they really jumped into the deep end to start the season playing four really tough Oregon teams to start their year. Uh, maybe not that big of a surprise that they went 0-4, but uh, you know, look beyond the record and the fact that they played Jesuit tough, they played Westland tough, uh, even back to week one where they had a lot of kinks to work out. It was still a, a pretty competitive game against Central Catholic, so not really a surprise that uh, now heading into league play, Camus is uh, you know, primed and ready to, to contend. Any games you're going to keep an eye on this week in football? I think you're going to see that... Um, uh, yeah, the 2A, we're going we're to find out kind of who 
might challenge uh, Ridgefield for, uh, you know, now that Ridgefield, they're undefeated, but I had a, had a big uh, uh, bad break where quarterback Braden Mayella is, uh, was injured against Washougal. He's out for the year with a broken collarbone. So uh, now the, the quarterbacking duties fall to a Logan de Trumont, if I, if I pronounce that, that name right. <laughs> I'll have to go back and make sure I got that right. But uh, uh, change of quarterback in Ridgefield. So who is going to be kind of nipping on the sputter's heels? Um, you have a game, uh, Hawkinson versus Columbia River. Columbia River, after a slow start, has won two in a row. And so between the Rapids and the Hawks, uh, whoever wins uh, this game on Friday might be a team that can uh, uh, that can – you know, challenge uh, and, and make a late run if Ridgefield is to uh, trip up. Speaking of Ridgefield, they have a, a tough game against Mark Morris, which, uh, you know, the Monarchs in recent years haven't really been a team that's con contended. Well, the Monarchs are right there, uh, one game behind Ridgefield. Uh, and so uh, they're coming off a big win against uh, uh, Hudson's Bay. They really haven't taken on any of the, the top teams in the leagues yet. But uh, if, if the Monarchs are able to upset the Sputters, it's a free-for-all in the 2A if that happens. <laughs> Thank you for your time, and we'll catch up next week. Anytime. Good to see you. Of course, you can find Micah and his team of reporters covering local high school sports at Columbian.com. They're also fantastic to follow on Twitter, especially when it comes to game days. There are a bunch of sports broadcasts coming up on Comcast channels 27, 28, 29, and 328 for HD. On October 7th, Battleground brings us football at 7 p.m. as the Tigers take on Union. Friday the 8th, Evergreen has Skyview versus Evergreen in girls soccer. And next week, on Tuesday, we have two volleyball games coming for you. First, Columbia River has Hawkinson versus the Rapids at 7 p.m. And also at 7, Evergreen brings you Skyview versus Union. All of these games are also available on the individual district's social media feeds, so check out YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter for the links. Hey, let's get social with our top posts of the week. This one from VPS Reschools account on Twitter. It's the foundation of the new field house going in at Kiggins Bowl as part of the renovation project happening there. The field house will hold the team's locker rooms, which will be a major upgrade for the players. It should be ready for the spring season. Our next post comes from It's Photo Time, who's posted this cool photo of Camus's Noah Christensen alongside his parents. Noah retweeted the picture and said his parents are his heroes. Nice job to mom and dad, and thanks for the great picture, It's Photo Time. Finally, a neat photo from Ridgefield Schools. This is a middle school golfer. It's a new program at Ridgefield to give students a chance to compete and improve before they hit high school. They're playing against other local middle school teams, and as you can see in the photo, they're looking sharp. To end the show, here's our play of the week. This one goes to Hudson's Bay defense and Justice Phelan. After Mark Morris fumbles this ball, Phelan does the rest, scooping it up and motoring to the end zone on just the second play of the game. Hudson's Bay defense was tough all night long, and even though Mark Morris got the win, Justice Phelan and the Eagles' D gets our play of the week. And that's it for us. We'll be back next week with more highlights and interviews. If you like the show, make sure to share it and find us on social media at Vancouver and Evergreen Public Schools on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. I'm Brian Slyke. We'll see you next week.